I can hear you very oh perfect now. So how do you have the camera positioned? Is it is it leaning on something or are you you're not holding it? <laughs> I, I made the most of my tripod. Oh I good. Tripod. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. your hair's so long. Guys, this is um <laughs> hi AJ. Mattia, you know AJ, I think. Um, hi, AJ. Uh this guys, this is Mattia Scarbolo from Scarbolo Wine in Friuli. And I'm gonna leave Mattia to introduce himself, his story, his participation in the winery. And it's been a long story uh, that I've gotten to know him, which is fun. And then tell us a little about, about Friuli in general also. Okay, of course. I think I'm the first Italian winery that you're doing in your... Um, yes, yes. Fantastic, there we go. Uh, so, and it's my first Instagram live. So, just oh, when I was late, I've been having some uh, technical difficulties that, that I wish I was going to have in 30 years from now. But I guess I came early to the... Technology <laughs> resistant crowd. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, yeah, so it's cool to be here. Uh, fun, good day. Um, yes, um, explain a little bit how this came to be. Well, first of all, I managed to change uh, after insisting for a very long time. Jeff's, uh, I don't want to say perception, but uh, <laughs> willingness. <laughs> to accept Italian wines. <laughs> uh, we, I used to, to live explain, right around the corner. To explain to everybody, I, I am a big Francophile and I always tease Mattia that Italian wines are not as good as French and we go back and forth. So sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's exactly the case. So uh, after a while of uh, insisting, let's put it this way, um, I managed to convince Jeff to, to, to get uh, my family's wines on the list. And that's part. Well, it started as a friendship, and uh, so so here we are today. I'm I'm happy to be the first Italian winery to be featured. Um, before I speak about us um, personally, I I'm a big. I remember one of the first chats me and uh, Jeff used to have uh, was about terroir. If you remember, uh, when we were at the Waverly, I was discussing the. Uh, how terroir, to me at the time at least, felt like it was not so fundamental. Uh -huh. I, of course, after spending a few years back at the winery, have completely changed my mind. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Experience. Uh, but um, nevertheless, I still am convinced of the fundamental importance the winemaker has. But before we speak about our philosophy and style, I think it's most important to speak about Friuli because uh, very few people know of, uh, of my region. Um, so for those who are listening and following and have no idea what I say when I, when I speak Friuli, Friuli is my region. It's the northeasternmost region in Italy, um, east of Venice. If you drive, let's say, 20 minutes east of Venice, northeast of Venice, you enter Friuli. It's a very small region. It's about 70 miles west to east and 80, 90 north to south. Actually, if I manage to zoom, let's see if I can zoom. So, Mattia, if, if, yes. if you yeah, turn the camera around and you can, yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Oh, fantastic. So I'm going to try and show you the Alps because the reason, so Friuli is famous for white wines. Uh, it actually was one of the, if anybody's read or is familiar with Vino Italiano, which is uh, one of the first recent books about Italian wines written in the early 2000s. It explains how Friuli's position in history is, but uh, Friuli was one of the first regions to turn away from um, the bulk wine to a little bit more of the contemporary style of winemaking. If you see back there, let's see, oh, there we go, up there, those are the Alps, so that's north. Right there, it's about 80 miles from here, 100 or so kilometers, is, um, is Austria. So we're very close to, I, I, one hour I'm at the border with Austria. And what the Alps do, they help us separate us from the very cold uh, northern breezes that come from northern Europe, from continental Europe. Nevertheless, if you picture Italy, I'm going to try and put this back. Let's see if this works. There we go. If you picture Italy, you see that east. So we have Austria north, 
Venice here, here we have Slovenia. And on Slovenian border, we have hills. We don't have Alps because the Alps slowly fade out until they become hills. And then we get to the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean. The hills being smaller, they allow a lot of wind to come out from the east, which is not as cold as the northern winds. Uh, so this helps keep Friuli a very, very uh, aerated region. Very, it's kind of like a natural uh, air conditioning. And this all translates with the, with the help of the Adriatic Sea as well, all translates into a very unique microclimate, which for who's familiar with the Santa Ines Valley in California, mm -hmm. kind of similar. Uh, actually, even the, in Ontario, um, the Niagara um, region. So you have the, yeah, exactly. You have the, uh, the basin, that, mm -hmm. that, that comes, that protects, that you face the, the lake. So you have the marine, the marine, the, the water element balancing and the basin in the back that protects. So this all helps similar areas. This all helps create in the summertime when there's the ripening of the grapes, all helps mm -hmm. create a prol prolongation of the um, ripening of the grape. Uh, it takes more time because we have very hot days, about 40 degrees Celsius. And in the nighttime, it drops down to 20-ish. So this means that the grapes take more time on the vine. They develop it as, uh, they ripen at a slower pace, more time to get nutrients. Uh, just like everything in life, the slower it is, the more, the better. So that's what has allowed to, for Friuli, through, uh, starting in the 60s, when the style all over Italy, starting in Friuli, changed to a more contemporary style of winemaking, uh, we started standing out with white grapes. Huh. Yes. That's, that's a really good explanation of the terroir. And what's the soil like there? So we have, so Friuli is divided in a few um, appellations. We are in an appellation, so you're a Francophile, as you say. Uh, of course, you're familiar with Grave in Bordeaux. My appellation is called Grave because there's a lot of similarities. First of all, if you look at the world map, we are on the same latitude. If you, if you draw a line uh, from Friuli, you get to, to Bordeaux pretty much. Uh, a couple of kilometers difference, but uh, uh, similar climate, similar influence. They have the river and the ocean. We have many rivers, but not at the same uh, uh, relevance in terms of size and hence influence on the vines um, and similar uh, soil, grave, cravels. Uh, we have a good balance between clay and limestone. Uh, there's a main difference from the appellation where I am, grave again, which is the biggest appellation and it goes all the way west to Benito. Okay. Uh, and starting one and a, two kilometers east of here, there's a river called the Tower River that separates my appellation from the hillside. So the hillside that you go, you get to Slovenia in about, uh, let's say 15, 20 kilometers, uh, you get to Slovenia. And between this river and Slovenia is the Collio, so the hilly side of Friuli, which is the historical, most uh, famous, most well-regarded, uh, I would, I, I admit it, the best winemaking area in Friuli. We originated uh, alluvial soils, so coming down from the, um, from the Alps, you have all the detriments that, that were originated from, uh, uh, all, all, with alluvial origin. Instead, uh, Collio is, is a more recent seabed rising origin. So we have a similar soil composition. They do have more, they do have more uh, uh, sea originated minerals that then, which combined with the illy aspects so the different facing of the sun and a little bit higher elevation gives a little bit more um, elegant, a little bit more, um, more clean wines, more clean, no, that's not a, more precise wines while in grave being a little bit more warm. Uh, you tend to have a little bit more gentle, more fat wines instead. Cool. Um, so tell us, 
I, you normally travel a lot, but maybe not so much this year, and then even more, less so now. What normally do you do at this time of year, and what happens in the winery this time of year as opposed to under the quarantine? Uh, yeah, so usually I would be, I think I would be in New York right now, coming to <laughs> to harass you. At the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the time of the year when I think most winemakers travel, because it's... Uh, uh, let's give a little bit of, uh, uh, let's say, look peek behind the curtain. Uh, as many restaurants tend to change the, the the wine list this time of the year for the spring and summer, that's when winemakers travel and try to get in the in the in Jeff's good graces. Uh, so this is when I would travel. I'm actually quite happy. I'm not doing it this time of the year uh, because I'm getting to experience. Uh, some of the key uh, time in the vineyards that I usually don't get to experience. Um, so this is when the life cycle of the vine begins. Um, we've had, despite the climate change, this is proving to be a pretty uh, canonical, pretty classic in terms of timing. Um, time Timeline of what happens in the vineyard. So until until last week, until 10 days ago, it was cold enough. We were pruning. We were, I'm going to show you actually the vines because it's quite beautiful to see. So let me take yeah, you a guys, second. Did you get any frost? Because Bordeaux had a frost, but you guys didn't get. I've seen about Bordeaux. Luckily, we did not. We risked having it uh, last, uh, so today's Tuesday, last, um, I think, Wednesday. But luckily, it didn't drop below zero actually it barely did but our buds are still so closed that there was no no problem so i'm gonna show you let's see so this is the buds right now there we go that's nice. beautiful that is beautiful. So this is a refosco a refosco is a native variety of friuli it's only grown in my region shares some similar uh, dna with uh, grenache and uh, and canonau also similar in style if you will um and let me see if you can zoom properly in. Ah, damn it. There goes my technology skills failing. <laughs> me. Okay, well, we've seen it earlier. There we go. So they're starting to, to open now. So last Wednesday, they were a lot more closed. Something like, something like this. Okay. If you can see right here. Uh-huh. There we go. Something like this, so it was still protected, although it did drop below zero. Um, so what I was able to do this time of the year that I never do because I travel, is I was able to come and, um, so you prune, you prune the, we try to prune the latest possible. So what is pruning? If you came here uh, a week ago, you would have seen the, the vines with many, many canes like this. It looks like it's very messy all the way up. And we leave it to the, as late as possible. We try to prune the latest possible, as close to the to the budding as possible, because this allows us to. Let's see. There we go. This allows us to to avoid risking um, any type of diseases to the vine that might develop if uh, if we start pruning too too early. Uh, and it starts, uh, the lymph starts going around. Uh, we need the lymph to start, you know, when the vine cries, when there's a little, it's called the vine cry, when there's the lymph that goes out after you oh. prune it. Uh -huh. That's the little Italian, water, if you, if you cut exactly. the vine a little water, okay. Exactly, we call it the cry of the vine. Uh, that has to happen when uh, the, the spring is already starting to kick in. And so you, you don't risk the lymph um, if there is an event of freezing or something like that impacting with the vine development throughout, uh, throughout the, the, the year. Uh, so we did that like 10 days ago. Uh, you clean it. Uh, pruning is actually very fun. I'm not allowed to do pruning yet. It's <laughs> something that takes uh, uh, quite a few years because... Um, <laughs> Yes. How many people uh, are on the team that, that they're still coming to work because pruning is very spread out? Uh, so, well, pruning is all done now. 
Um, people at the winery that are the prune are, are, are two plus my dad. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people who go after them, because after you prune, you throw, so here in between the, the vines, you throw all the canes that are dead. And, uh, and after that, you have to bend the, the way you see here. You have to bend the, 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 crane, the crane that you choose for that vintage that's going to yield the grapes. Yeah. Um, and after that, you have to uh, tie the vines, especially the younger vines, the ones that are just born. You have to tie them so that they're, they stand properly. Yes, the, the, the more, the, the more um, vertical they are, properly vertical they are, the safer it is when the tractor comes along. They don't, oh. the, the, re, the wheels don't risk hitting it. They don't risk breaking the vine. It sounds like silly details, but these are actually the, the key times. Pruning is the key time, is the key work. That's why very few people are allowed to do it. Because when you prune, you have to see how the vine has developed throughout the previous years, throughout its life, and see how the lymph is going to go, how mm -hmm. the lymph is going to um, move throughout the central structure of the vine. And, and you have to choose the proper cane that's going to be the best yielding for that vintage. And so it's really a work of experience. There's universities of uh, uh, master classes, let's say, let's call them master classes. Wow. Universities too much of pruning. Um, so I'm not allowed to do that. I just <laughs> come and tie and, and put everything straight. Well, your dad's uh, very slow to hand things over also. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what all wines do you make then? What grapes do you grow and what wines do you make? Um, so fr Friuli is... Okay, so we share the name, our appellation at least, is shared with Grav. So not only the name of the appellation, but many varietals grown in Friuli are international varietals. Uh, we have... Um, Many of the varietals that made Friuli famous um, throughout the world, although not everybody knows it, if you drink Pinot Grigio, there's a one out of, I would say, considering the bulk Pinot Grigio that is sold to them, I would say 35% of the Pinot Grigio that you drink in Italy comes out of Friuli, which combined okay. with Veneto, it goes to more than 50 uh, Veneto and Trentino Alto Adige, so the three-state three area northeast of Italy. Uh, nevertheless, nobody is known about, uh, uh, nobody can think of Friuli when they think of Pinot Grigio. It's because most of it is sold bulk to Veneto, and that's where okay. you get the big wineries. Uh, so Pinot Grigio is definitely a, a staple varietal for our region. Uh, Sauvignon as well. Sauvignon demands... Uh, a climate that is a little bit cooler, is a little bit more um, not not as hot, not as um, aggressive in order to develop, develop its properly its aromatic structure. That's why usually Sauvignon in Italy, you get it from Friuli or Trentino Alto Adige too. Didn't you tell me uh, something about Sauvignon coming a century ago from Bordeaux because of the Grobs connection? Uh, no, well, Sauvignon, uh, it came a little bit more than a century ago. It, it came uh, about all, most of the French varietals came starting in the 80s. Uh, there's a, a myth that uh, oh, okay. the grapes were brought over by the Napoleonic Wars, but that's not really true. Um, okay. um, most varietals were brought over from either monks, which are actually think monks, think back a thousand years, yeah, and even post phylloxera. Actually, even the it's a big. We can open an entire chapter here, but monks are the biggest preservers of varietals okay. in Europe. If you think about it, mm -hmm. um, either monks or, or trade merchants. For example, Pinot Grigio. I just cited Pinot Grigio. Uh, Pinot Grigio was brought over to Piedmont in the uh, late 8th and uh, 19th century, so 1800, yes, uh, by um, Piedmontese army general. 
he tried uh, planting uh, Pinot Grigio so that it was not thriving. And then it slowly made its way east. I see. Yes. It Veneto and then it hit Friuli. Uh, so the same, we put in Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet, uh, varietals that thrive here that we consider part of our own culture. And that's something that I personally, um, it's, it's, um, it's something that really fascinates me. Like what we consider a native varietal. Yeah. Uh, how many years, how many centuries does it take for a variety to, to be considered native? Yeah. Tokai Fulano is one of my favorite, it's my favorite uh, white varietal uh, that is native in my region. But it's, it has, it originates from Savignonas. Um, we consider that native, although the history of vinification of Tokai is much shorter than the history of vinification of Pinot Grigio in Friuli. So personally, I consider Pinot Grigio more of a native variety, at least in terms of uh, the cultural representation that it has with us. Um, so many international varietals, some native varietals, uh, Refosco, um, Ribolla Gialla, which is both done as a still and a sparkling wine. If you go around Italy now uh, to any restaurant or enoteca, of course, you still see Prosecco, uh, but uh, there's, it's the up and coming alternative is sparkling Ribolla Gialla because okay. it has a little oh. bit more of an elegant tone, yes. Uh, Tokai Friulano, like I said, uh, we cannot call the wine Tokai anymore. We can only call the vine Tokai. Once it's vinified, we have to call it Friulano only. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Susan had asked about the Refusco, what you make with that, uh, if you make it sweet wine. And then AJ was saying he misses the Romato or would like some Romato right now. Can you talk about those two oh, wines? There we go. Yeah, sorry. I, I cannot read the comments, but That's thank okay. you for I'll, pointing I'll them you. out. So, yes, Ramate is right here. And oh, I'm happy nice. I can speak about this in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Refosco. So Refosco is, uh, so yeah, we're in the vineyard of Refosco. We have two vineyards of Refosco. Um, Refosco is a very, I would say of the varietals that we vinify is my favorite native varietal. Um, and uh, I think it has, especially with climate change, such a huge potential. Um, because Friuli, as climate starts changing, I'm talking, of course, in a matter of decades, uh, places like ours, we're in the flatland, uh, we won't be able to grow Sauvignon anymore. Let me rephrase it. You can grow Sauvignon. You can, uh, you can do all the vineyard management the technique leave more leaves, yeah. uh, do all the things that allow right. you to still get a good fruit. But it comes a point where you have to accept the fact that a varietal is simply not suited for that terroir anymore, and you have to look for something else. Yeah. This is something that Gaia is doing, the many great winemakers throughout. You have to be aware of how the situation, how your surroundings are changing, and you cannot stay in denial. So um, what's beautiful is, yes, we're going to uh, lose some white varietals, but what's beautiful is that we're getting better and better uh, red, red wines, especially the Fosco. So the Fosco is actually one of the varieties that has been, uh, um, that has the long, one of the longest histories in Friuli. Uh, there are traces, so a few kilometers south of here, there's a town called Aquileia. We went through it together, actually, when you okay. were here. Uh, it was one of the main Roman settlements outside of Rome oh. in Northeast mm -hmm. Italy, yes. Um, because Friuli, a little break, Friuli is where most of Italy's history was somewhat written. Uh, the barbarians going to Rome, they came through Friuli because they skipped the Alps, they just went through the hills. Okay. World War I and World War II, Austria and Slovenia and the Cold War, 70% uh, of the Italian army was stationed here during the Cold War. This is wow. where most of it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, so um, Aquileia uh, was very important at the time. Uh, big city. Doing the, doing the excavations, they found traces of Refosco being vinified already uh, oh. more than 2,000 years ago. 
the problem with the Fosco is that it's a, it's a baby maker. It's a, you see a cluster of the Fosco, it's massive. It's gigantic. Really? We do, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, usually we get, for example, for Pinot Grigio on a vine, we do green harvest, we do a series of technique, uh, changing on the varietal and everything. But uh, on Pinot Grigio, we get 1.7 to 2 kilos, 1.5, 1.7 kilos per, um, per vine of grapes. The Fosco, you get m more than three. And despite we try to cut it down as much as possible to concentrate nutrients mm -hmm. and flavors. Uh, but it's, it's really a very fertile uh, varietal. And the thing is, um, historically, it's always been the farmer's wine. Oh. Uh, because, yes, because it takes a long time to ripen. It takes a long time to get a proper uh, phenolic uh, ripeness and technic, uh, ripeness, technical ripeness. Um, for the varietal, so when farmers in the past, think before uh, winemakers times, just classic farmers trying to uh, go on and, and survive day by day, whatever, season by season, um, they were selling easier uh, to ripen varietals uh, and keeping the Fosco for themselves. Of course, a, um, a farmer who keeps things for himself is not gonna put a lot of effort into the things he does for himself because oh, it okay. so much time goes on to to do things that you sell the cheese the the prosciutto whatever the farmer used to do at the time you're not going to be fancy making the wine so throughout his throughout the years the fosco has had this um perception of a very very metallic harsh bitter uh, like really rustic red wine mm -hmm. so what well i say we but at the time i was barely not even born what my father wanted to do at the time was let me show you a different interpretation of the fosco something a little bit more hefty a little bit more heavy more weighty how by taking inspiration from uh, the amarone producers uh, so very simple technique. Uh, it's not allowed in the DOC. That's why our Refosco is an EGT, because oh. the DOC, besides being a geographic appellation, is also a series of um, rules that you have to follow to vinify. Yeah. Uh, same, I think, as in the AOC in France. Uh, yeah. So doing the EGT, we're allowed to do a passimento, and a passimento is what is done with uh, uh, Refosco, uh, with uh, Amarone. You harvest the grapes. Uh, put them in a little basket and let them dry for about, uh, um, we do, depending on the vintage, but usually uh, two to three weeks, about 40% wow. of the water evaporates. And this allows sugar concentration. And then we ferment in stainless steel, but age in oak. And this allows the wine to edge, to smoothen out a little bit of the rustic component and get a little bit more weight. That's the way we do the Fosco. And I'm very proud of it because um, it, one of the things that, uh, and even with Ramato, um, I, I think we fell a little bit. Now it's me and my sister in the winery working with our parents. My sister is a bit younger than me and she's the winemaker. We fell into this choice of whether to do, you know, I think at every generational change in a winery, you of course follow a philosophy that was impacted, started uh, the company, but you want to bring your own and, uh, and try and, and, uh, and show what you perceive, what you feel and try and communicate it properly. So what me and Lara wanted to do was to um, do what our father did in a little bit more aware form. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, try and, how do I say it? 
I don't want to say be rock and roll, but it pretty much sums it up. Um, yeah, do things your way, you know. Yeah, of um, course. Not really. Okay, there's a market for this. There's a market for white Pinot Grigio. Everybody knows Pinot Grigio. Everybody drinks Pinot Grigio. You can do if you do it in a smart way, the right price, uh, the right technical way of making it. You're always going to sell Pinot Grigio. Yeah. But who are you in the end? Uh, right. Why not do something that you know you, you feel that you believe in? Maybe you're gonna put a little bit more effort. Uh, maybe it's gonna fail big time, but if you succeed, what's better than than doing something you believe in? And uh, it's like you 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 don't you don't really work a day uh, any day because you're you're having fun uh, trying communicating everything you do you do because you like, and when you do right. everything that you like, it's every day is fantastic. Um, so so I how does I that affect a little bit? So no, that's okay. It explains the uh, it, every generation does try to make their their uh, you know footprint. So what are you doing different with the the Ramado and the Pinot Grigio? Oh yeah, so Pinot Grigio, yeah. So um, very few people know that Pinot Grigio, but if you think about it, we all should know. Uh, Pinot Grigio is a genetic modification of Pinot Noir, just like Pinot Bianco, Pinot Blanc. Um, the thing is, Pinot Grigio managed to maintain a dark skin. It's considered a white grape, but if you go in a vineyard, depending on a series of factors, uh, but overall, the color of Pinot Grigio is dark. Grigio, gray, it looks in fact like a grayish, pinkish uh, um, colored grape. Mm -hmm. And uh, Friuli, having grown for such a long time Pinot Grigio, before the invention of contemporary ways of making uh, uh, Pinot Grigio and wine, started in the 60s, 70s, actually it was Mario Schioppetto, is the father of uh, Friulian white wine making, mm -hmm. because he brought German technique uh, in the winery. Uh, and French vine growing style. And from one day to the other, um, to sum it up, Pinot Grigio and all white grapes were made like red wines uh, until the 60s, 70s. So skin contact. If yeah. you peel a Merlot grape, if you peel a Cabernet grape, it's transparent. Where the wine gets the color is in the skin. Right. So that's why when you make a red wine, you crush the grape and then you let the juice sit with the skin for an X amount of time so that the color goes from the skin to the juice. This happened for white grapes as well. Um, and, and as long as the skin is transparent, you don't really get much color. The moment the skin starts getting color, like in Pinot Grigio, the real color of Pinot Grigio is actually this one. So it looks like a rosé. But if you say rosé, you're unbelievably wrong. <laughs> it's the opposite of a rosé. We call it Ramato in Friuli. Uh, it can be called Ramato anywhere else, but uh, Ramato is the way, just an historical name for skin contact Pinot Grigio in Friuli. What you know as natural wine, skin contact wine, macerated wine, this is what it is. Any Does it wine... have something to do with the color copper also? Yeah, yeah, because Ramato means coppery. Okay. Yes. And that's why, that's why there's the association with the copper color. It's okay. more, I would say it's more proper than orange, especially because at least with copper, you don't get the question if it's made with the skin or the pulp of the oranges. <laughs> right. And it's so, um, like, it's just a stunning pink color. It's very vibrant. Yes. It's, uh, but yeah, it's the opposite of a rosé. A rosé is a red grape that, is, that spends very little time in contact with the skin. Yeah. Uh, so it barely gets color. This is a white grape that spends a lot of time on the skin and gets the color. That's so funny to say exactly the opposite, but you're going to be in the rosé section all year long. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Some battles you have to, to lose. 
Yeah, yeah. But it's delicious. <laughs> I, I'm excited for it every year. And this is perfect weather for drinking it. it. Clearly, AJ, he has a beautiful backyard and would love some right now. So I'm going to ask Nicole at Soilaire for a list of retail places that sell it. I'll put that up. Um, how's you. everybody doing? Uh, so Friuli, unfortunately, has the, I think we hold the record, which is not a good record to hold, but uh, as the most law-abiding region in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19 regulations. Yeah. So, yeah, nobody's breaking the law. Everybody's staying home. Everybody's being but... very religious. So luckily, we didn't have a lot of uh, cases in Friuli. I think we're less or around 100 people dead, okay. uh, which is still, of course, significant, but compared yeah, to Lombardia but... and other regions, I would say we yeah. are blessed. Yeah. Um, and I must say, um, I personally feel very lucky because I get to be in the vineyards while so many yeah, of us much so. are in the apartments locked up. And I think, I think well, to maintain sanity, there's... It's my respect and admiration. Well, yeah, that's why I wanted to do this, because so many of my friends are cooped up in their apartments in New York, and it's really nice to get out for a minute and to hear the birds and to see the vines. Um, when this lockdown happened, I was chatting to a friend who said the vines don't stop, and you guys have to get out there and keep keep tending to the vines so that we can have wine in the in next year. And... Uh, and then there's so many happy hours, like virtual happy hours and wine tastings. I wanted yeah. to show people, um, maybe educate a little bit, show them some wineries they don't know, maybe some regions they don't know. And then also uh, to just show, you know, talk a little bit about wine, how it's made. And I didn't expect the philosophy and history from you, but I'm thrilled that you were able to speak of all that. Yeah, very, been, very uh, cool. Yeah, I'm a very different path ever since I'm here. It's good. It's good to... Uh, so I'll be very clear. When I joined the winery, it was a little bit of, uh, uh, after so many years in a different environment, professionally and socially, I was, let's say, maybe a little bit arrogant. And no. uh, <laughs> and then you take some beatings and you say, okay, I got to. <laughs> <then> the... <laughs> but it's actually the most pleasant thing ever. I'm very happy to, to learn about. And yeah, it's fun. Um, Good. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up just to keep it under 45. I'm trying I have to break these up in 15-minute segments on uh, okay. Instagram TV. But um, it's really good to see your face. Thanks for sharing us the vineyard. Um, give my love to your family. And you. uh, we'll talk soon, I hope. Thank you. Me too. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for having me. It was uh, fun. I hope it's my pleasure. something interesting. If anybody – thank you, everyone, for participating. Anybody has some questions or anything, I'd be happy to answer via message or whatever. Yeah, Mattia does the Scarbolo Instagram accounts. You can always reach him for that. And uh, I'll certainly, we'll both let you know when you're coming to New York to um, see your face and go to your tastings and uh, like hearing about Friuli in person. You're a very good educator. I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, you, uh, it's interesting for the wine professionals, but it's interesting for everyday consumers too. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right, we'll talk soon. Everyone. Yeah, you. Grazie, my love to your family. Okay, bye-bye. Ciao. Bye.